All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Maybe just the students in the room. How about good morning? All right. There, there's, some, there's some energy. Um, my name is Anya Kreitney, and I work right here at the Library of Congress. And for the past three years, I have shepherded the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature program alongside our energetic and unwavering program partners at Every Child a Reader who are here today. It has been a true delight to work with such a wide array of collaborators inside the library and out, all working to champion children and young readers across the country. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce the person who not only manages this library, but has a special appreciation for young people just like you. In fact, the Librarian of Congress was herself a children's librarian, so she has a deep understanding of what young people think and what they like. So please join me in welcoming the 14th Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Thank you, Anya. Oh, thank you. And of course, I'm so excited, all the papers just flew down. You notice I can't stop holding the books because yes, I am a librarian and we're here and now as you step into the new year, we're celebrating today and we have students and teachers and librarians and reading champions of all ages. So thank everyone for being here today and also those that are joining us online. Now, for those of you in the room, I just wanna tell you, yeah, I know it might be a little tight and a little warm because we had an issue in our auditorium, but we said the show must go on. And so we're all here and we're just as excited and we are really um, just so pleased to be able to celebrate books and reading. And so before we get too deep into the program though, I wanted to acknowledge the schools that are here today. So. When I call the name of the school, if you could let me know and let all of us know you're here. And just because it's a library doesn't mean you can't make noise. <laughs> so is Columbia Heights Educational Campus here? Oh, please. <laughs> can we, do we, we can help Columbia Heights? All right. Cardoza Education Campus. Truesdale Elementary School. All right. Put the hands up. Okay. Well, as everyone knows that works with me and has for years, that when I see library, this library in particular, filled with creative young people, it really lets all of us know that the future is bright and full of potential. And as a librarian of Congress, it's my job to ensure that everyone, including young people, feels welcome here. And I want you to find your passions and your stories reflected in the items we preserve. I know firsthand how personal connection deepens curiosity. And so I encourage the young people here to come back to a unique space that we created, the Young Reader Center and a programs lab. Tell us what you like, what you don't like, because we're building another space that's gonna be even bigger and we need your input. I also want to tell you that I have to say that books and reading have been a motivating force in my own life. And they've taught me new things. They've allowed me to be here today. And so that's why the Library of Congress created the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature Program. We want everyone to be able to dream big and use literature to do it. In 2008, the Library of Congress enlisted the rock stars of children's and youth literature. And just the reception that Jason Reynolds and Meg Medina got when they came in shows you these are rock stars. 
And now for 15 years, we've watched as each national ambassador travels across the country meeting students, teachers, and librarians to build enthusiasm for reading, writing, and learning. And while each national ambassador is different, they all have maintained a signature platform that summarizes their vision and encapsulates their missions. So in a minute, Shana Burkhead, our, from our program partner, Every Child a Reader. Can we give a hand for Every Child a Reader? <laughs> we'll give remarks and touch on our impressive list of former national ambassadors. But before I turn it over to Shana, I must thank the Library of Congress James Madison Council, the Capital Group Companies Charitable Foundation, Dollar General Literacy Foundation, and Candlewick Press, Meg's publisher, who has generously donated a copy of Meg's books for each student in the audience today. So you will go home with a book. So they make it possible to do this. And Shana, come on up. Thank you so much, Dr. Hayden. Today is the start of something grand, the beginning of what promises to be a fulfilling and busy two years. Beginnings are important. Beginnings help us know where we are. They remind us that we are new to something, that we are learning. Some beginnings, like today, are big, a celebration. Then there are the quiet beginnings, the start of the day, the opening of a good book, those first few words of a good conversation. Beginnings, big and small, provide a place to start, a launch pad of sorts. In Meg's platform, Quintime, Let's Talk Books, Meg is providing that launch pad for young readers, families, and communities everywhere. It's an opening, a chance to share and be shared with. From the start of our conversations about her platform, Meg talked about the invitation that is Quintime. She talked about how her family uses the word and what it means to sit down at the table and catch up. She also shared that Quinto is story in Spanish and that for her daughter, Quintime has always meant story me. In a recent interview, Meg said, that is what I want for kids, story me. We want to bathe them in our family stories. We want to bathe them in books. We want to story them up as much as we can. I adore this, quirk, this quote. I adore its quirk and its thoughtfulness. In the swell of excitement last week, I kept hearing the same thing from people, comment after comment about Meg's thoughtfulness about how she walks through life with such regard for others, about how she ponders and delves deep. It's something that I've been able to witness time and again over the last few months. I know that thoughtfulness will be a hallmark of Meg's time in this position, adding to the story of the 15 years of national ambassadors shaping the reading lives of this country. And what an extraordinary group they have been. John Sheska, Catherine Patterson, Walter Dean Myers, Kate DiCamillo, Jean Yang, Jacqueline Woodson, Jason Reynolds, and now Meg Medina, all approaching this role in very different ways, but all bringing the same core traits. Compassion, love, respect for young people, humor and honesty, the admiration of their colleagues. Each ambassador has been the right person at the right time. Each has taught us new ways of approaching books, of how we share those books with others, and of how we share ourselves with others. If Meg and I sat down today and said to each other, story me, I know what I would talk about. I know what book I would share and how it would tie into the me that I am today. But what I cannot wait to find out is what that conversation looks like in a year, in two years. What will I learn about myself, about books and sharing books and stories? What mark will Meg leave on me, on the world? I am certain it will be grand. <laughs> Every Child a Reader is so grateful to Meg for leaping headfirst into this exciting and daunting task. We are so grateful to Candlewick Press for leaping with her. Um, we love our job and the amazing people that we get to work with and support every day. Children's book publishers across the country, the Library of Congress and its smart and dedicated staff, and most especially those passionate heroes who support and inspire young minds every day. So I'm pleased to take this opportunity to thank the booksellers, the community leaders, the educators, the public librarians, the school librarians, the community organizations, and the parents and caregivers 
all working tirelessly to share books, share stories, and offer paths to inspiration and growth. Speaking of inspiration, it is my honor to welcome Jason Reynolds, the seventh National Ambassador for Young People to the stage. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Y'all good? Yeah. Okay. I, uh, I won't be, be before you very long. I just um, want to speak, actually, I want to speak directly to you. Meg, uh, as you embark on this journey. Three years ago, uh, Jacqueline Woodson stood on the stage, our friend Jacqueline Woodson, and she passed this medal to me. And, um, and I thought, as I built this platform and worked with all these wonderful people to build a platform, that what I would be doing is engaging with young people to encourage them to read and write obviously, right? Like this is the part that's baked into the job. And then it all started. And it made me question what exactly are stories for, right? It's like, yes, I'm supposed to go and encourage them to take part of this, right? to take part in this and to engage with these things and to sort of use them for what? Right, was the question that I had to sort of contend with, especially as we entered into COVID. And I realized very quickly um, that actually, even though our jobs are to perpetuate, proliferate the ideas around storytelling, writing, reading, learning, literacy, that actually what we're doing is proliferating and perpetuating the ideas around what it is to be human. And I think sometimes we, for, we, we can forget that. It can get lost in the making of the thing, right? In the object of the thing. When the truth is, the object doesn't matter nearly as much as the human that holds it. And, and so my ambassadorship and what I learned, and you'll learn your own things, right? But what I learned is that this is human work. That what we're actually doing is tapping into the humanity of the most human amongst us, right? Helping them to hold on to that humanity so that they might grow up and actually save the world, right? Meg, I, it, it, it doesn't escape me that you and I get to be a part of this history and that just as Jackie passed it to me, I get to pass it to you. And I wanna tell you that the, the metal is heavy, <laughs> physically heavy. Like it's, this, this is the heaviest medal that you will ever put. I know you don't want all the awards. This is the heaviest medal you will ever put around your neck. But, but I want you to know that it's also heavy in other ways, that it does come with a weight. Um, but I am certain that you have the capacity and the backbone to hold that. And more importantly, Meg, I know that you have the heart. Right? I'm proud of you. I'm grateful for you. Y'all are in for a treat, young folks. And uh, it's my honor to be here to celebrate with you. Thank you, Jason. And another round of applause for Jason. He was a tireless ambassador for reading and learning during one of the most challenging times that we've all had to face and we appreciate your grace and your generosity and your energy during the past three years it was really incredible so thank you and now we're on to the guest of honor the one we've been waiting for miss meg medina please give her another round of applause because she is the new National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. And yes, this is a big deal, and the medal is heavy. And Meg, we're gonna bring you up in a few minutes, but I want to share with everyone a little bit about you uh, with our audience first. Meg is a Cuban-American and spent the bulk of her childhood in Queens, New York. She first, I heard a little something before Queens there, heard a little something. She first started her career as a teacher and taught for 10 years before becoming an author. 
She's also our first Latina national ambassador, a historic and important first. She writes picture books, middle grade books, and novels for teens. She won the Oscar of Young People's Literature, the Newbery Medal. <laughs> and she has written two more books in the same series. She's won many awards, including the Ezra Jack Keats Award, the Charlotte Zolotoff Award, the Pura Bell Prey Author Award, the Latino Best Book Award, a Syllabus Award, alongside numerous citations and commendations. She cares deeply about the books that children, teens, and families share with each other and enjoys focusing on the ways culture and identity intersect through the eyes of young people. In fact, she will harness this superpower of caring during her term. Her signature program will invite teens and children and families to use books to connect with one another. And we're gonna hear more about the platform later. She's an incredibly open person who welcomes your thoughts and as Jason said, your stories and the things that you care about. She believes in the power of stories that we pass down through generations and she believes in the power of family. In fact, many members, including her daughter, are here today. Could we have you stand up? These are the people, yes, stand up. Ah, oh, here are some more over here. I didn't get to say hello to you. These are the people who inspire and sustain Meg. So we really appreciate that. And so, Meg, it's time. Everyone, please welcome the 2023-2024 National Ambassador for Youth, Young People's Literature, Meg Medina. <laughs> yes, Jason. Limber up, but I'll show it to That's everyone. So pretty. It's beautiful. I know it's beautiful, oh my and goodness. it is heavy, but you wear it well. Oh my good, it is. <laughs> Meg, <laughs> thank it's you your so time. much. It is heavy. You're right. Hi, everybody. Good morning and muy buenos días. A todos. <laughs> and thank you, Dr. Hayden, and thank you, Jason, for all those beautiful words. And to the entire team at the Library of Congress, Anya and Maria and Sasha and Shayna and the whole planning team who have worked so hard in the months behind the scenes to make this day happen so flawlessly. And of course, to my friends who are watching on live stream. <laughs> Hello, I'm really glad that you came this morning. And um, I'm always gonna think of this as like one of the most important moments in my writing life. So I'm so glad that you're here. So sometimes life is really unexpected. And sometimes the things that we think about in a far off way come to be when we least expect them. Over the years, I've had the privilege of watching seven of my colleagues help shape the reading lives of our nation's children. And each of them brought their own vision and style and their own definition of what mattered to them most about books and about young people. And each of them was and is, to me, a giant of goodwill and vision and hard work, and each, in a way, has been my teacher. And during all of those seven terms, I would often say to myself, what an awesome job. What a great opportunity to be able to serve. How lucky we are to have them. So, 
When Candlewick called me and invited me to an emergency mystery Zoom meeting to share the news about Dr. Hayden's decision, and might I add it was a few days before my daughter Sandra's wedding to Scott, you can imagine how overwhelming it was. First of all, because I was trying to figure out how to keep mosquitoes at bay during an outdoor wedding in Virginia, which is hard. <laughs> okay? But mostly because, my friends, I could see that it was just this enormous act of trust. I was being asked to take the baton from Jason Reynolds, who we all know is a once-in-a-generation creative force and I was being asked to find a way to add my own vision to his. I'm an author of works for young people of every age. I'm also the first-generation daughter of immigrants who had to make their way in a new country with that sad mix of loss and hope that is such a deep part of that experience. I'm a person who moves in more than one language, though not always smoothly, and more than one way of understanding the world. I'm a mother who raised decent people who, among many other wonderful things, are readers. I'm a former public school teacher and proud of it from Queens and Florida. And I'm also, perhaps, your colleague, and your neighbor, and your reading friend. I believe in listening, and I believe in the power of personal story, and I believe in respect and compassion, and I believe in truth. So those are the skills that I bring to this job of serving our nation's children right now at this moment. That's all 74 million of them <laughs> under the age of 18. <laughs> Armed with that, um, I'm here for the hard and beautiful work of helping them reclaim joy and agency and helping them build a reading life. Friends, we are at a time when we need to help our young people find their way back to joy. We are at a time when we need to reset and find a path back to understanding and respecting one another. And I believe a reading life can be part of that solution, and I'm going to do my level best to make that happen. What guides me is a lifelong belief that reading is something much, much bigger than a school subject managed by adults. As a former teacher, I have to confess to you that I worry when we talk mostly about reading in dire terms of what happens when we don't read X by, by X time or with Y speed. Your ears will fall off. Just terrible things will happen to you. Now, those are practical concerns, of course, and to be clear, we most certainly need to provide instruction in the skills of reading. But that cannot be the endpoint. In fact, it's only the entryway. To me, true reading is that moment when the ink on the page disappears completely in your mind and you find yourself laughing aloud at something that happened. It's when you really cry, the ugly cry at the sad part, or when you have to put the book down because you're just so worried about what's going to happen next, you cannot take it. <laughs> it's when the fantasy world feels so real and relatable that you want to live there or maybe be best friends with that main character and maybe you have a costume in your closet from that book. It's when we discover in nonfiction a fact about the real world that is just so surprising you can't wait to slip it into conversation because it blows your mind. It's when you feel, though, that you have the agency to choose what you like and to follow what interests you 
enjoying everything from books that feel like cotton candy on your tongue, just evaporating, to those that feel so stark and true that it's like you got a punch to the gut. That version of reading has the potential to help young people truly come to know themselves. That version of reading helps them understand other people better. That version helps prepare them to step into the wider world on their own when we're not with them. It's joy and knowledge and refuge. So I am off to have a two-year conversation with 74 million people <laughs> about that kind of reading. Tengo los patines puesto. I have my roller skates on, which is what my mother used to say about busy people who had to dash from one place to the other. My platform is called Cuéntame, Let's Talk Books and it does have three parts. I'm off to classrooms to have live book talks with kids about the books they love and they want to tell me about, and I'm going to share with them some titles that I admire and think they should know about, adventures and graphic novels and nonfiction and poetry and science fiction and fantasy and contemporary fiction and bilingual books and, yes, audio books, all of it will be welcome as part of our book talks. Cuenten, me niños, what books are in your heart? I'm off to discover great public libraries across the country and connect kids and families to those libraries, especially families who have not yet felt comfortable or welcome there. Libraries are not the shushing places of yesteryear. They're not for an elite class. Not even this beautiful, grand library excludes you. This space belongs to all of us. And I mean all of us, whether you've been in the U.S. forever, for generations, or whether you've been here five minutes. A public library is a vibrant place, and it could be a building block of a family shared literary life. Cuéntenme bibliotecas. How are you connecting with families? I'm off to create a curated list, a collection of recordings of authors who are writing for young people, authors who are thinking so deeply about young readers and holding their true experiences sacred on the page helping kids discover new things to read and new authors to follow, helps them know how to keep exploring. Cuenting me, authors, why do you write what you do? What do you believe about yourself as an author? What do you believe about young people and about the work you make for them? So you can see, I'll be busy. I'm going to be in conversation in a second with Dr. Hayden. So in closing here, I want to tell you that I'm keeping Jason's words very present. This is heavy. A few weeks ago, though, in a private conversation on the phone, he said to me, Meg, here's the thing. It is an honor, but it's a job. <laughs> and, Keeping it real, people. <laughs> so I am entering this with a sense of service to our country's young people. I'm going to work hard for you so that when it's my turn to pass the torch to the next ambassador, I will have left something for them to start with. But ultimately, to the young people here right now and to all of them watching, to the young people in the U.S., I hope my time in your service is going to help you use books to feel happier. I hope my meetings with you are going to help you use books to know your friends and your family and your neighbors better. And above all, I hope that these two years I spend with you will help you see yourself as powerful literary citizens no matter your age or circumstance, 
and I really look forward to our time together. I brought some books, too. You can't have two book people who aren't going to book talk. And we'll talk about book talking. That's right. But let's start with the fact that you're the first person with Latino background to serve as ambassador. What does that mean to you? Well, um, so... It means multiple things. I'm the ambassador for, as I said, all the nation's children. But I am very aware that this will hold a special place for Latino kids. And so um, what I bring to the role, I think, is this. Like the knowledge first that there's not one person who can represent this entire group. We're so diverse across every country and uh, every way that you could possibly make a community diverse, it, it is true about the Latino community as well. But I think what I share with like young people who are Latino in this country are a few important and potentially embarrassing things. <laughs> the first is that I, I was born here, and so I have had to navigate two cultures at the same time how to be Latina or Cuban in my mother's house and in my family, how to be American in school. I speak Spanish, but kind of lousy, so there are moments where I don't know the word or I have to go hunting and pecking for it. Um, I write English much better than I do Spanish, of course, and that ends up being sometimes for Latino kids a source of, like, am I here, am I there, what group do I belong to? Our parents sort of hassle us about that also, you know? Um, and I feel like I can be an, ex an example, an answer to the stereotypes sometimes that are damaging about Latino families that we don't read, that we don't value education, like those kinds of things. So I guess what I'm hoping is that all kids, but certainly Latino kids, can lay their eyes on me and visualize themselves here, and visualize themselves as readers, as literary citizens, as you know, powerful people in their own life and in their community. So what led you to be a literary citizen? I love that term. Yeah. What, what led me? I don't, I don't know, I think, I think my family, when they arrived, like many immigrants, arrived with a sense of trauma sort of built into that experience, right? You don't leave your country and your family and your friends behind and so on without a sense of loss. So when they arrived, the way that they dealt with that trauma, I think, and that sadness was through a lot of storytelling. So our apartment, was always filled with stories of Cuba and stories of the chicken in the yard and, you know, when my grandfather established the school here and, you know, when Thea worked at the telegraph office and this entire universe of Cuba and this sense that I had roots and this sense that there was something before me. And it opened my ear for story. And I had a grandmother who only went to school to the eighth grade, Bena, and she was m uh, the best storyteller, very dramatic, and always knew like when to pause the story and never necessarily thought about what was appropriate to share with like a five-year-old. That's so I got a lot of stories. And, and I think that's just it. It, it does. It just became that. And then in school, maybe you had this experience. We 
were always given time to read after lunch mm -hmm. for 30 minutes. And it became a habit. It became something that I look forward to. I'd run like crazy during recess. I'd run till my, you know, like when you run so hard that you get a headache, you know, and it pounds in your head? I'd run like that, and then we'd come in, and there was a book. There was a place to just sort of reset. So I don't know. Story, I think, was just used as a way in my life to feel better, and it just kept growing. I think from there. And family, you mentioned that, played a big part. My what? Your family. Yes. And so in your characters and your stories mm. that you write, family I comes do. after you. I Is she I, in there? I'm so intrigued by family, right? Because they love us so deeply. And sometimes the same people who love us can hurt us so deeply, right? Like, and sometimes we have, you know, there are foundation, there are frustration, there are all the things, but that is family, right? That is what, what it is. And, and I grew up, I don't know if this happened to anybody, but like everybody was in my business, right? My aunts had opinions about what I was doing. My mother had opinion, you know, like if I did something wrong, there had to be a collective response, you know, as I discussed what I had done, you know? Um, so if there was never, not even remotely, the idea of like that m my mother was only in charge of me, the whole family was in charge of me. Um, so, yeah, I love writing them. And I love writing uh, quirky family, flawed characters that we love anyway. I love writing mistakes that we fix. I love writing regrets that we resolve. I think that's the human experience. That's the experience of family. Cuban families, everybody's family, you know? One of the uh, universal things that you wrote about, we talked about as we came in. As I came in, I had, of course, the Newbery award-winning book, and then I slipped in this one. <laughs> yeah. And the security people asked me about this <laughs> Of course they would. Okay. Did you get a Can detention? Can I say it? <laughs> yes. Jackie Delgado wants to kick your ass. Mm, yeah. Right on the cover. <laughs> That's the first line. Spoiler alert. The first line of the book. Yeah. So, we yeah. talked about that. Am I in trouble? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's a bestseller. <laughs> can't do better than that. Your editor told me that. <laughs> but I t one of the things I shared with you was name was different, but the sentiment was the same for me. You Some got young bullied. ladies, yeah, yeah, said the same thing in another place in Chicago. So yeah, this universality too. It's your experience. So how did this happen? How did this happen? It happened. I was in your same shoes. I, a girl, th the first chapter of this novel is almost verbatim the experience that I had, except that I was in seventh grade as opposed to ninth, and in this novel's case, um, and a girl in a rabbit fur coat came up with a message, you know, and the message was, I was going to die shortly, right? This, this girl was going yep. was gonna to beat me yeah. up. Yeah, girls. It was a really... Uh, <laughs> oh, it's, it's a terrible experience. It is. It isn't. You, get, you really get really afraid, and it changes um, your sense of safety in school. It changes... It changed for me in the real moment my sense of trust in adults to be able to help me. I couldn't... I didn't feel like I could trust the people at the school to help me at that moment. Um, and I felt, worst of all, that I couldn't talk to my mom about this. I couldn't talk to my mother about this. So I ended up just transforming during, um, from the eighth grade on, 
into just as hard a person as I could be. I stopped going to school. I cut a lot. I just became, What? Yes. I took a really bad downward turn. And then I grew up. I, I you know, I yeah. got past it. I, I developed into a, a grown person, a happy person. But that experience, right, always stays with you. You always remember it. And so I was asked to write a, a story at the time about a, a turning point, a Latina at a turning point. And most of the time we think of turning points as really positive things. But sometimes when we grow up, we hit a place that turns us in a wrong path for a while. And so I decided to mine that. And so I wrote this book because at the time also we were having and continue to have lots of reports in the media about school bullying and the impact on kids and the sometimes really terrible uh, final results that happen when, when kids find themselves so targeted and lost and afraid. So I wrote it. And um, I've been, it's 10 years old, this book already. It's going to come out as a graphic novel in oh. this year. So I'm very excited um, to celebrate the book's anniversary this way. But the thing that has been beautiful is that it's been used in classrooms and in libraries to talk about an issue that is so real to kids' lives. When I go to schools and I talk about this novel, I, I, there's always one or two kids afterward who want to stay and talk to me, and their question to me is, what do I do? I'm in this spot, what do I do? How do I feel better? That kind of thing. So I think for me, this book helped me make sense of something that was really painful that happened to me. But the joy of it is that you can take something really hard and in reading and writing, transform it into something that is powerful, that can move the ball, can, that can create change. And so young people are talking about this book. Like, who am I in this story? Am I Yaki? Am I the, am I the bully? Am I the victim? Am I standing? Like, what do schools do now that's different? What, what can we do that would really be helpful and change this? And I talk a lot about the ecosystem of bullying in a school just generally. Um, not only student to student. Sometimes it's student to teacher bullying like a substitute. Sometimes it's teachers and, and how they bully students and principals to teach, like the whole thing. So the conversation has been so rich around it. And of course, people get concerned sometimes about the title. They look at the title and they're like, ah, my hair's on fire. We can't possibly have that book. And what I always um, try to remind people of is you need to look at the the whole book, at the whole story, at it, what it's asking kids to examine, and not react to like little pull things, right? But to really react to what is the potential for good in this work? Like what can this book do? So yeah, that's that. And to realize that maybe young people use that term. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Just a little bit. <laughs> you see how I turned her name into Jackie, you know, because yeah, yeah. that was my nemesis. Uh, <laughs> but that's, that's the thing. There's a truth to it. And to try to deny young people, uh, to try to deny young people uh, literature that speaks the way they speak. Yeah. And that tells their stories. It's something adults are trying to do even, well, they've done it for a long time, but yeah. even now more. Yeah, my, my position is always this. I think the most powerful position that we can be in with young people is when we are in communication with them. When, it, when we're in open, frank, respectful exchange with them about what they really think, about what they're really living, 
about the questions they really have. I feel like when we suppress those things, those conversations, we don't, um, we risk losing them. We, 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 we push them further into secrecy as opposed to bringing them toward us. So, yeah. And so your platform, because you talk a little bit more about Yeah, what so cuéntame. So um, Sandra's here, my daughter. We were, when, when I got the news and they say you need a platform, I was really scared because it was like, <laughs> I got nothing, right? So I was in the yard with Sandra and um, talking. And I was describing to her sort of what I wanted to do. And you know, Sandra, and, and Alex and Christina, my children are, are all born here, of course, also, and they're even more centered on English than I am, right? So they, they're, they're really, really English speakers. So she said to me, how about, cuéntame, like, because when I sit down with anybody, especially friend, and all my friends here will know that, I'll go, so cuéntame, how are you? Like, what's up? Uh, to, it's so tell me, it's like, it's a warm, it's like when Jason got up there and said, hey, y'all good? <laughs> right, that's so him, right? That's exactly how he greets everybody. I greet everybody, oye, cuéntame, how are you? You know, so that's coming your way, folks. <laughs> so, um, but when you break it down, Sandra pointed out to me, she said, it's story, cuento, and me, right? Me, story me. And you know how little kids are when they come up with phrases like that are like, story me is a wonderful thing. And as soon as she said that, it was like I had this flashback to sitting there reading her um, Chrysanthemum. Do you know that book by Kevin Hanks, Chrysanthemum? Mm, yeah, I, have, I see some fans in there. Chrysanthemum and um, I, just all the different books that we enjoyed together. And I decided I want to story them. So I know some of the young people got scared when I said I want to bathe you in books. That would be very uncomfortable, I realize. Um, but let's think metaphorically. Um, yeah, just giving, connecting kids with, with books and how to talk about books in a way that isn't like the discussion questions at, in class. No offense, teachers, but you know, the crossword puzzle you have to do, the vocabulary list that you have to reply to, like all of those things. I can honestly tell you, when I want to tell my friend about a book that I love, I do not ask them to do a vocabulary list with me, <laughs> nor do I give them a crossword puzzle. I say, you have to read this book. L let me just tell you, and I'll grab, you know, a page or a sentence, or I just say, there's this scene when, and I'll just give them the scene. And you know what's great about that? Sure, I'm telling them about the book, but the thing I'm mostly telling them about is me. It's what's in my heart and what, what matters to me, and that's where it is. So reconnecting kids with that, how we do that, how we talk with passion about books, I'm interested in that. And I think like teachers, we could, we could com get them coming along. I mean, it's persuasion if we must talk in edu education land vocabulary, yeah. you know. Yeah. But um, I think it will work. And then I wanna connect with libraries. I love libraries. And by the way, I need to come back and tour this about a million times. I, did you walk around at all and just look up at the words, the mosaics, the, it's, it's mind boggling. So connecting families to libraries where they maybe have not felt that they belong. Like how to get a library card or how to ask for help without feeling like that they look silly or something like that. And then finally, I'm really interested in getting kids to meet new authors. That the ones that they may not know, that aren't already big, splashy um, voices, but the new voices coming up who are really exciting. Um, I could for sure tell you a lot of Latino authors coming up um, whose work is just gifted. 
luminous, it's exciting, it's, it's coming. And I just think if, if we can record them, if we could get these authors talking, snippets about what matters to them, about what they think about what they wrote. Why is that your best minute? I'm gonna ask them, read me your best minute in this book. Why did you pick that? What does that tell me about you? What is, what do you believe about being a kid? Like those kind of questions. It's hard. It is hard, so I better prep them before yeah, I throw them into them the know. studio. Yeah, you know. But you know what I mean? I, well, and people who know me, I, you can't say I'm not going to be intense because, uh, come, yeah, that's a well, problem. Well, you just demonstrated uh, what librarians and teachers call especially a book talk. And you did it really well, so I know we're clicking here. So how do you do a book talk, and can you demonstrate it? I'm so glad you asked, Dr. Hayden. I have a few. I, I happen have a few. to have here. I have a feeling that you will do it. And I'm, this will be really quick because, um, you know, you want to eat and go and so on. So this book, so it's, we're coming up February 1st is World Read Aloud Day. Make a plan right? You're going to read something aloud, and it, it could even be what you're reading in the newspaper that morning, okay? You want to read it to somebody. I, however, this book is coming out in, I believe, March or April. It's by Juana Medina, who is not related to me. <laughs> Full disclosure. Mira, Elena monta un bici. Elena rides a bike, and if you flip it over, oh, oh you see? You can read this book in Spanish or English. So do you remember learning to ride a bike? That was painful too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah, it was kind of awkward. <laughs> Did you fall a lot? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. OK. I, I'm a librarian. That's how it ended. <laughs> That's why. Well, listen, Elena has the same problem. Elena wants to ride her bici, which is a bicicleta, and she gets on there and she has some trouble. But what I love about this book is that when you are about the age that you're learning to ride a bike, you're also about the age that you're learning to read by yourself. And this book is for kids who are learning to read by themselves. And I guarantee you, they're gonna have moments where they wobble, and when they crash, or when they go, as happens to her, cataplum! <laughs> this is yeah. such a great read aloud because you can go cataplum, cataplum, cataplum in Espanol, or you could go kerplunk, kapow. You could fall lots of ways in lots of languages. <laughs> and so I think this book is magic. And I would love to read this aloud with kids. So that's how I book talk, right? I don't I say it. about, I, do I have, a, do I have I need, yeah, one more? Yeah, because I needed this okay, you see. back in the day. This might have been helpful. <laughs> this might have been helpful. Because I took to reading, not biking. <laughs> so this is my You know book. who taught me how to re ride my bike? was my cousin Ada, who oh. might be watching today. And she, I don't know if she remembers it, but it was on, on the street in Queens. And the moment that I remember is that Ada, who I used to think looked like Cher back in the day, right? Cher. She was running next to me, and I was pedaling, and suddenly she wasn't there. And that moment, when you're by yourself and you're like, ah, I got it. And then... Got that plump. Right. Yeah, that was the moment. But you know, it happens. Here's another one that I really love. It's called Wishes. And what I love about this book is that Mo Muan Thi Van, the author, had to leave Vietnam with, in, with her family quietly in the night during the 1980s. And this is the story of a child who is leaving her country in the night with her family. And all the wishes that she has as they're packing, as they're saying goodbye, 
as they're finding the boat, etc. The pictures are just luminous. And I'll just read you the first couple of pages. Wishes. The night wished it was quieter. The bag wished it was deeper. The light wished it was brighter. The dream wished it was longer. And I'm going to stop. The pictures are so lush. And it has like a nice rhythm. And you can learn words. You can, you know, dream wishes. There's all kinds of ways that we can explore it. But you know what I love about this is that I would use this book all the way with high school people. Hmm. I might do a social studies unit. I might do an immigration unit. I might do a unit about Vietnam. I might do lots of things. So when I think of picture book, I never just think of very, very young people. I think of a poem with pictures for everybody. And that's it. That's what I'm taking on the road, people. Yay! <laughs> I'm still keeping this one. You yes, no. I got this one. Keep that. This got that blonde one. That's what book talks do. And we're surrounded, too, by people who uh, want to share that passion. And I just want to give a shout out to some of the advisory committee uh, members that are here. Uh, if you could just wave and. Well, Deb Taylor, you're here. <laughs> yeah, there they are. Look, they're so caught up because they're like, when they see a master book talker, we all know one when we see one. So we're going to have some time for questions and answers and okay. things like that. But is there any advice that you would give to people who are looking for their passion that you've obviously found in sharing stories and books and things? I do. I think that we need to let go of a lot of shoulds. I think you should, adding a should, I, my advice is to follow the things that interest you. Read widely and in all formats. Audiobook, graphic novel, novels, nonfiction, try it all. And read, um, Read things that you don't immediately go to. Like sometimes, I, st I don't know if you do this, I stand in front of my shelf sometimes and I say, what's not here? Right? What's not here? And then I try to find something that I, um, that I can put there that is a new form that I d I'm not familiar with or I, um, an author I haven't read before or whatever. But the, the thing is, don't be afraid to put down a book. Oh, thank you for saying that. Yeah. <laughs> book guilt. Yeah, yeah. You have to finish it like your broccoli. Yes, I know. There are good recipes, however, for broccoli. We I can know. talk about those later. But there's so many thousands and yes. thousands of yes. books. You need permission to put a book. If it's not the book for you, find one. Yeah. I know. What, sometimes we, that, we, yeah. we make people finish books that they don't, that they don't like. Yeah. And I, I don't think that's really necessary. You can give, give a book a chance, right? You can give it a chance. But like, if it's not happening for you, there are just so many, Thank right? You. So just go find the next one. And do, but the one thing I do, though, when I quit a book, it's like a breakup, right? I have to think about, what oh, didn't work out here. Right. You know, were the words too hard? Was the subject too, eh? You know, like, what was it that, that turned me off to it? And then I'm off to find the thing. And do you have, like, a lot of people in your life who, who say, oh, you should read this and advise you? <laughs> like, and what's your favorite book? Yeah. I say, I haven't read it yet. Yeah. Right? Right? I've got a few contenders, but... I count on my friends to tell me 
the books they're, they're reading. I, you know, my friends who, who have blogs and things like that, but also just my friends who say, hey, did you read this? I, when they're passionate about it, I'm like, oh, okay. I'll, I'm gonna try that, I'm gonna pick that up. And I do the same for them. I try to bring them things that they may not, um, may not be aware of. That's it. A new recipe. Yeah. We are gonna have snacks. I think, <laughs> so we should. So the advice is to be open to uh, new things, but not to feel that you have to uh, follow through on things that No, not all the I mean, really, if it's, there are too many good books in the world to suffer with one that is not doing it for you. So if it is not the book for you, it's for someone else. That's the point. Yeah. It could be for someone else. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's open it up. We have uh, mics. Um, did you want to run it? Well, thank you, everyone. Wasn't that fantastic? Let's have a huge, oh, huge, you. huge round of applause. <laughs> you can stay there. Can you hear? Yeah. 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 Oh. I might ask a question yes. from the floor. And you I'm know here by myself. <laughs> can, you, can we? The well, ambassador no. will see you now. Right, exactly. <laughs> this, this is office hours, everyone. Um, well, now it's time to hear from you all in the audience. Um, as you have seen, Meg is kind and compassionate. She's warm and she's eager to hear from you, especially the students in the audience. So the librarian mentioned questions a couple of times. I hope you, were, you had your uh, listening ears on and your questions at the ready. So and we have a, a mic runner here in the center of the audience. And uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand. And perhaps you can say your name and your school. Uh, Allie, right here in the white. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Maya, and I have a question. Uh, Meg says she would visit schools, right? Yes. Is she going to visit that public school she once taught in? Oh, oh very good. Uh, interesting. I don't know. They have to, I think, to... For me to visit, they have to apply. Like, there's a whole thing. But wouldn't that be something? I'd love to... Can you imagine if I went back to the same junior high school where all this happened? That would be an interesting school visit. Um, but I would love to. I'd love to go to any school. Thank you, Mike. Hello, my name is Cynthia, and my question is, um, how, many mix, how many books have you made? How many books? I think. Oh, boy, uh, this question. I think 10. I think 10 when you're picture book and novels and, and so on. And I sometimes write stories also that go in anthologies, which I also love. Um, my name's MJ, and I want to know if we're going to have photo opportunities with you. <laughs> <laughs> Ask that question again. I didn't hear. Photo opportunities. Are you, are you available oh, for I, camera ops? Yes. <laughs> 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 yes, but not too close. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Let's go here and that right here, yeah. Hello, my name is Aaron. I'm from Cardozo. And do you prefer fiction or nonfiction for fictional books? Oh, man. Okay, so I write both. I write mostly <coughs> fiction, although I have two uh, chapter books that are Nonfiction. One uh, is about uh, Pura Belpere, which comes out this year, and one is um, about Sonia Sotomayor, our Supreme Court Justice. So I love them for different reasons. I love the emotion that I can sort of mine in fiction, but I love knowing things and discovering things about people and places. So I like to see like spaces, classroom spaces, community spaces, where we mix fiction and nonfiction, where we pair those things for like maximum impact, right? So that you know the actual things that happened, let's say in a time, and you also get to have a story that's sort of set in that time. 
So I don't know. I love them both. I write mostly fiction, but I love them both. Right here. Um, my name is King, and have you ever read a manga? I haven't. Should I? Oh, manga like like the um, comic. Well, I'm not a big manga fan, but something tells me you might be. Are you? <gasps> what do you love about it? Why? Why? Can, and can you recommend one for me? I love the art style, and I recommend One Piece. Okay. Of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, of course, this has a history there. Hmm. Thank you for that recommendation. I am going to, I'm going to explore. Thanks. Right here in the center kit, yeah. Right here, and yeah. Hi, my name is Jada, and my question is, um, how old were you when you made your first book? Mm. Oh, so that's an interesting story. I think 40 was when I first started writing. I know, ancient already. <laughs> ancient already. All right, so, so here's the background on that and what I want to spare you. I didn't know, growing up, I didn't know any authors. Growing up, I didn't know anybody who worked in publishing. I didn't have any idea of how a story would become a book. Like, it seemed completely out of my league. And it took me years and years and years of trying many different jobs that I liked to get the courage to try to do this myself and figure it out myself. So it took me, I was a teacher, I, I did lots of other jobs that I really loved and liked, but the thing I really wanted to do was write stories myself. And it took me a long time to have the courage to say, mm, I'm gonna try. So, you know, I, one of the beautiful parts of now, when I see authors doing school visits, when I see kids writing their own novels, penning their own stories, posting them on blogs, and so on, it's like, that's right. You do not have to wait until you're 40 or later. Um, now, on the flip side, I would say that I meet a lot of people who feel like, I'm never going to do it, I'm never going to, and I say to you, there's no age. Mm -hmm. There's no time that's, that blocks you out from doing anything you really want to do. You got to jump out of the plane, so to speak, you know, and, mm -hmm. and try it. Go ahead, right here in the front. Do you like books that are based off of shows or movies? Hmm. Interesting question. Sometimes, sometimes mm -hmm. I like, sometimes, but I have to decide that the book is one thing and the movie is another thing. So that I can completely like the movie for what it is and I can completely love the book for, for what it is. And I'm gonna tell you something. Somebody taught me, it was my oldest daughter, Christina. And so, <laughs> who is here in the front row. <laughs> so my daughter, Christina, growing up, um, had difficulties reading. It was, it was a tough topic for her. Um, way until she was like 13 or 14, she was still really struggling with reading. But she really liked watching the Disney Channel and lots of different shows on, on those channels. And the bookstore used to have these paperbacks that were based on all of those TV shows. So I used to go to the bookstore and I would be getting my books and my daughter would be filling up the cart with all of these books that made me like this. I was like, I don't want to buy these books. You know, I wanted her to buy something else, re read something else. But she wanted these books. And... I won. She won. <laughs> <laughs> and Christina won. Uh, she became a reader because she knew those characters. She could... She already knew what was sort of going to happen in that episode, and she could rehearse her way through it. And 
Then she went from those books to People Magazine, and now she has a fuller bookcase than mine. I mean, she goes shopping at Barnes and Noble and other places, and, and she will pick um, books for herself. And so there's no way to say how somebody's going to become a reader. And sometimes people become a reader through a movie, like the other way. And so I think the main thing is to get out of the way and let them become, let them attach to story in the way that they need to attach to story and then see what happens. Yeah. Thanks, Christina. Okay. <laughs> Allie, just behind you, there is a hand right here. Right here in the purple shirt. Or are we stretching? Okay, thank you. My name is Elvin, and have you ever had any goals? Mm. Goals? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I had. And in fact, when I decided to become a writer, I wrote them down. I, I said to myself, I was really shy. Mm. I hadn't been writing, and I, I, I shy about being a writer. Like, I was afraid to say to people, I want to be a writer. So I wrote a mission statement for myself, and I wrote a whole paragraph about what I wanted my life to look like one day around books. And then I, fold, I started to cry because I felt like, I, I can't ask for this. Who am I to imagine this for myself? And I folded up that letter and I put it away. And I have to tell you that almost everything that I wrote down on that letter that still exists today came true. So there's something about being able to put in your mind a vision of who you want to be that helps you start to be that person. So I don't know, that's, that's the, the time that I had to really write goals the most for myself. I think we have time for these two last questions. Just over here in the, right there, Kit, yep. Right behind you, right there, right behind. I love these yep. questions, they're wonderful. <clears throat> um, have you ever made sofrito? No. So, have I ever made sofrito? Yes. yes, claro. It's on the basis of everything. Tomato, okay, okay, sofrito is tomato yeah. and green pepper and onion and garlic, and it is the basis of essentially every Cuban dish that you will ever eat. It's just um, yummy. There's also a book, I think, sofrito, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. So, both work. And, um, okay. Um, my name is Jazeel, and have you ever played video games before? Okay, I knew this was going to come up. <laughs> Look, <laughs> it's like this. Video games came out, and Pong, do you remember that? Just that you have to be old to remember that. It was just a tennis ball going between two sticks. Tuk, tuk, tuk. I was challenged by that. Um, so... I have a neighbor, uh, Doug, whose son, uh, Grant, is a wonderful uh, gamer. And so I keep asking them to, that I would really like to play video games now. I know that sounds crazy, but I, I think video games have evolved to include story. And I love story. And I'm really interested in how kids share story as they play video games as well. So I know, you know, a lot of people are like, video games, you know, they have lots of opinions about it, but I have, I'm a little more open-hearted about them. So I could use a tutor if there is someone out there who would <laughs> like to volunteer to help me in my video game evolution. I, I'm taking names. See, see Anya at the end of this assembly <laughs> and let me know how I can contact you. All right, let's do one final question. 
Um, let's do right there, right next to you, Kit. Right there, the hand gray shirt. My name is Emily, and have you ever collaborated with someone? Yes. I love to collaborate with people, although I'm probably a very difficult person to collaborate with because I'm picky. Um, but yes, I love collaboration. I collaborate with people in my career all the time. So you are looking at me with my books, but the truth is that for this book to happen, or this book to happen, I needed um, my agent, Jenny, who sold the book. I needed my editor, Kate, who made the book better. I needed my, my publicity team who, who figured out how to talk about this book to schools and libraries and bookstores. I needed um, editors of newspapers who were gonna talk about this book. I needed friends who advised me when I was writing this. Like, it takes a lot of, um, a lot of ideas and a lot of working together to make any project like this, any book, happen. And then sometimes I do writing like in anthologies and so on. And we have to work together to figure out how to make our stories fit and how to make the book sing, so to speak, right? With all the stories together. So it's a good skill to have. And, and the skill is basically this. You have to be able to tell people with courage what you're thinking. You need to be able to listen to what they're thinking is the right way to go. You need to find compromise sometimes. It's a skill. It's negotiating. And I think I'm going to be taking that skill with me as an ambassador because I have to listen and you have to hear, and I have to hear, and we have to work it out together. Yeah. Didn't she thread that beautifully, everyone? Please, let's give her a round of applause. Meg Medina, 2023 National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Okay, we, we, if that wasn't enough, we're gonna close out the program with a little treat. Uh, Meg gave us some uh, homework with video games, so hope you all were listening. Right now, note cards, or very shortly, will be passed to you uh, with some pencils. Um, and on that note card is a question, I'll read it to you. What do you want the ambassador to know about young readers like you? I'll repeat it. What do you want the ambassador to know about young readers like you? And on this side, it's addressed to Meg, and you fill it in. You can even write in your recommendation for your video game. And Meg, being the scholar, researcher, and ever-curious uh, author, is gonna take this into her advisement as she goes on all touring the country. <coughs> so, please, um, those who are watching online, you, I encourage you to share. Send that feedback to literature at loc.gov. Again, literature at loc.gov. And really, there's no more else to say except please, let's give her one more round of applause. <laughs> and to the Librarian of Congress who joined us here today, of course. And uh, shortly thereafter, you'll get a dismissal from our own uh, Lauren Rosak. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. Thank you.